And with that in mind, let me welcome her, Alice Kimmaker from NYU, to tell us about topological defects in Okay. So, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for this wonderful, uh, organizing this wonderful uh, conference and for inviting me here. Uh, so, the title of my talk is Topological Defects in Tokyo Circuits. Uh, I'm a theorist and uh, I apologize in advance if the talk appears to be a little too uh, theoretical. Uh, but uh, anyway, I'll try to not make it sound too abstract. So first of all, I would like to thank uh, my organizers, uh, my uh, my collaborators. They are a former NYU postdoc, Mao Tian Tan, who's now in Korea, a current NYU postdoc, Ko Yoon Ye, and uh, my other collaborators are uh, Yifan Wang, who's a high energy theorist at NYU, Akin Roy, who's an asthmatic theorist at Cologne, Fei Yan, uh, who's a postdoc uh, at Brookhaven National Lab, and uh, and some of the uh, results we actually uh, simulated it on the IBM quantum computer, and that part of the uh, of, of our uh, project involves collaborations with Sutapa Samantha uh, uh, and Amin Ami Rahmani at Western Washington University, and Derek Wang, who's at uh, IBM Quantum. And uh, all the results are present today appear in the following three publications. So what are topological defects? So if I just want to give a one sentence uh, explanation of what it is, it's a unifying way to en encode non-trivial boundary conditions, also known as twists and symmetries. So boundary conditions, you can think of it as a system which is you put a periodic boundary condition, and so there's no defect. I can put some junk somewhere in the middle, and that's a defect. But what topological defects uh, are trying to do, uh, they're telling you that given a particular model, there are some very special boundary conditions which do something non-trivial to the system. And also, uh, the idea of defects is closely tied to symmetries. And then you would wonder, well, what's new about symmetries? We've been learning about symmetries since God knows when. Well, uh, the interesting thing about these symmetries are that they're, they're not just unitary symmetries like the ones we learn about in quantum mechanics. There are also what are known as non-invertible symmetries. Uh, and this is where I want to take the mystery out of this non-invertible symmetry thing. Uh, for uh, mm -hmm. a, an example of this is uh, the Kramer's one-year duality. So anybody who's taken a course in statistical mechanics and learned how to solve the 2D IT model, one knows that the, a powerful method used to find the critical point of the 2D IT model was using the fact that this model had this duality. Now, it turns out that the reason why I got really excited about this topic is that this duality is not a red herring. When I learned about it, I used to think, oh, this is only occurring in the 2D IC model, and therefore in the 1 plus 1D quantum model is just something very strange. Well, what I learned in the last few years is that these dualities are really very, very general, and that there is actually a formalism out there to write down a model, write down all its symmetries, both the unitary symmetries as well as the so-called non-invertible symmetries. And, uh, and these non-invertible symmetries are actually tied to something that we love to do in, in condensed matter, which is construct models which, has no, which have non-abelian excitations. Uh, so, okay, but I would, because this is a topic which is related to non-equilibrium physics, I would also like to explain my own motivation for getting into this topic. So we know that when we study non-equilibrium systems, especially quantum non-equilibrium systems, the biggest problem is heating. You're just pumping the system and the system heats, any non-trivial quantum physics is only observable over like a few picosecond time scales, and after that, it's gone. So a big problem has been to kind of uh, get get over this heating problem, and there are many ways to get over the heating problems. One of them is to work with these so-called integrable models, and in integrable models, we know what prevents heating is that there are many symmetries which lead to many conservation laws. But but in the last few years, people have, uh, especially from the high energy physics community. And this actually also has a history among condensed matter physicists have realized that you need to think about symmetries in a more big way. You shouldn't just think about unitary symmetries. You should think about these so-called generalized symmetries, which include non-invertible symmetries, which I'm going to talk about a lot, and also higher form symmetries, where these conserved operators are not just point objects. And, and this could be very useful for us who work in non-equilibrium quantum systems, because somehow if we identify additional symmetries, however exotic, Maybe we will be able to use that as a leverage to prevent the heating problem, right? I mean, so that's really one of the uh, motivations here to somehow see how all these exotic symmetries show up in a driven quantum system. So let's get started. 
Well, so what is the simplest model which shows the so-called non-invertible symmetry? As I was mentioning, uh, there's a 2D Ising model which is related to the 1 plus 1D quantum Ising model. And, uh, the sim and we often study it in, in, in this language, the Ising model which after a Jordan weakness transformation is a Kitaev chain. So I would say like until 2016, I, used to, 20, I would say 2020, I used to think I had nothing new to learn about the Ising model slash Kitaev chain. But then I ran into these papers by Ace and Bentley and Wong, and I realized, oh, there's still more things for me to learn. <laughs> and, I was, and so, you know, you keep getting shocked. Uh, and anyway, so let me just tell you what was uh, interesting there. So uh, what is the Kitaev chain? So the Kitaev chain is spinless fermions uh, 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 with some popping amplitude T and some pairing <coughs> amplitude delta, and there's a local chemical potential. You do a jordan Wigner transformation, and you can map this model to the famous Ising model. I just want to put a cautionary note here, uh, uh, as, uh, ignoring a non, some non-local boundary terms. Uh, so uh, you get the Ising model, where, uh, in, where in doing this transformation, I've set T to be equal to delta, which is equal to J. Now we know that this Ising model has two phases. When J is greater than mu, uh, you are in the ferromagnetic phase. In the original fermionic language, you are in the topologically non-trivial phase. Whereas when J is less than mu, you are in the paramagnetic phase. In the original fermionic model, and you are in the topologically trivial phase. So it, what happens in the ferromagnetic phase uh, or, uh, slash um, a topologically non-trivial phase, when you put open boundary conditions, you have these dangling Majorana modes, right? So we all know that, and that is the reason why uh, uh, there are all these experiments uh, being done to realize these Majorana modes in the lab. But this is exactly our first uh, example of some non abelian physics, because these Majorana modes, let me call them sigma, think about, so you have an open chain and you have a Majorana mode on one side and a Majorana mode on the other side. What does this exotic looking formula mean? It is sigma cross sigma is equal to one plus psi. Well, it's just saying that if I take these two Majorana and fuse them together, I get the complex fermion, and the complex fermion could either be occupied or empty. So it's, uh, it's either a fermion even or a fermion odd state, and that is, that is what this one plus psi is saying. The psi here just represents the fermion parity, right? So sigma cross sigma is equal to one plus psi, so when psi, uh, psi can take two values, uh, one and minus one. So uh, the two possible values on the right hand side just means that when I bring these two minors together, I either get an empty fermion, empty fermion or an occupied fermion, say. Okay? But this is also an example of a non-invertible symmetry. Now let me explain to you why. So this is the, on the right hand side, you have an ordinary symmetry. This is just fermion parity. <laughs> when you take the square of this, you get one. It's a real, it's a, it's a real operator, psi diameter is equal to psi, and when you take the square of it, you get one. It's the usual unitary symmetry that we all learn about in quantum mechanics. But now on the, on the left hand side, on the other hand, the sigma is also some kind of a symmetry, because this is a Majorana which commutes with the Hamiltonian. But it's not an object where if you take, multiply it with its dagger, you get one. Sigma plus sigma instead gives you one plus psi. So this is actually the simplest example of a so-called non-invertible symmetry. It's a symmetry in the sense that it commutes with the Hamiltonian, but it's not necessarily unitary. Okay? So the take-home message here is that whenever you have some kind of non-abelian physics going on, you have actually what is known as what people are referring to as a non-invertible symmetry. Okay? And okay. Oh, sorry. So uh, uh, what what's really nice about this is that this is not the only model in which you can have these kind of non-invertible symmetries. In fact, we have a, 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 a toolbox available to us where you can build models out of a fusion category, and, use, and, and this is a scheme for uh, arriving at a zoo of models that have these kind of non-abelian anions. And I will also explain to you that these are also topological defects, and, in, and I'll explain to you why the word topological defects is used to describe these objects. Uh, another very in exciting development is that, at least what I learned from these papers written by uh, written in around 2020, is that uh, these things they usually when you uh, when you uh, these kind of uh, uh, um, relations are seen a lot in conformal field theory 
And that's also another setting in which I used to go to sleep because I used to think, oh, conformal field theory means everything's in the continuum, everything is in the ground state, and none of us, nobody in this room is working on a ground state problem. On the other hand, uh, we know that, uh, on the other hand, using this formalism, you can actually construct these kind of non-invertible symmetries on a lattice and also for a flow type system in an out of equilibrium <coughs> setting. You can have a Hamiltonian, or you can have a flow unitary, or you can even construct non-Hermitian operators where these kind of uh, symmetries appear naturally. Okay. So, are there any questions so far? Okay. There's one here. Yes. Question. So, in terms of the Kadai model, uh, what, what you need here is that you can write explicitly down the um, Majorana operators in terms of the spins and the calculate their uh, algebra, right? Uh, I will explain, give you an, I will tell you explicitly, explicitly what it means in a, in a couple of slides. So, sorry for that. So, I'll just ask you to wait. Okay? So I just want to explain this uh, model building from a fusion category. So this is again, unfortunately, a slide which is only uh, probably useful for theorists in the audience who want to use this as a method to apply themselves. Uh, but I think graduate students will find it very useful because, uh, uh, so what is this model building from a fusion category? So the way I should think about it is that angular momentum addition is also an example of a fusion category with a slight difference. And I'll try to explain that difference. So in a fusion category, you have a set of objects, simple objects. If I was talking about angular momentum, this would simply be your angular momentum. Zero, half, one, three halves, and so on and so forth. And so when you add angular momentum, it's like fusing two objects from this category. So you get A cross B is equal to a bunch of different simple objects. If this was truly angular momentum addition, then the A's, B's, and C's are related like this. A plus B is greater than equal to C, B plus C is greater than equal to A, C plus A is greater than equal to B, and the sum A plus B plus C is an integer, or zero otherwise. Okay, so this is just angular momentum addition. Moreover, I can construct a matrix. Uh, N, A, B, C is just saying, uh, is a number which is either zero or one. It's zero if these two things cannot add to give me C. It's one when these two things <coughs> add to give me C, and these are the conditions under which N, A, B, C is 1, but I can still construct a matrix like this N, A, B, C, then the max largest eigenvalue of N, A is known as the quantum dimension, and this is nothing but actually uh, the size of the irreducible representation of A. And moreover, you have the associativity rule that is obeyed, which is that if I'm fusing three spins, the answer doesn't depend upon whether I fuse B and C and then fuse A, or whether I fuse A and B and then fuse C. And moreover, this associativity condition gives you these relations between the quantum dimension of uh, uh, between the quantum dimensions of uh, 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 of the simple object A, B, and C. So, okay, this is everything I said here is like adding angular momentum, but there is one difference between. Uh, adding angular momentum and a fusion category, and that difference is that the number of uh, irreducible representations in SU2 is infinite. There's no limit, because A plus B plus C just has to be any integer. Whereas, whereas in a fusion category, A plus B plus C it, uh, cannot be just any integer. You put a limit to it. So for example, there is a series known as A series, which is closest to angular momentum addition. Uh, so the fusion category, for example, a k plus one is one which where you have uh, k a non-negative integer, k is always a non-negative integer, and you have k plus one simple objects, zero half k over two. So the important thing to note is that in the a k c a k plus one series, you always truncate the number of simple objects to k over two, and so. Uh, now the only difference now is that when I fuse two objects in this category. A plus B plus C should be less than equal to K. Whereas for angular momentum and Z, A plus B plus C is uh, now is just limited by K. Okay? And the Ising model is obtained from fusion category A3, where you have uh, uh, basically three simple objects. These are simply the identity, 
a quantity which is known as sigma. I'll tell you in a second. This is our so-called non-invertible symmetry. I'll explain in a second why. And then the third uh, simple object is just the uh, is known as psi is nothing but the Z2 symmetry of the IZ model. So uh, sometimes it's represented as one sigma psi, uh, uh, um, or otherwise you just write it as zero half and one. If I was using my uh, the language of the previous uh, slide, and so now you can see how uh, these fusion rules are coming. So sigma cross sigma is you're fusing half with half, and uh, this this can be zero or one. So you get one plus psi. Whereas uh, whereas sigma cross psi, uh, it's you're fusing one with half. But this is not angular momentum anymore, so you don't get half plus three half, you only get half. Because you have to uh, obey a plus b plus c is at an equal to k. So uh, using the simple rule, you basically get the Ising, um, uh, 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 the familiar Ising uh, fusion algebra. But this is just like some games, right? So now I want to just, uh, I, I just want to actually construct a model out of it. So uh, so let's, let's, say how, uh, let's see how we construct a physical model. So to construct physical models, uh, you, there's nothing which says that you have to do this in 1D. So uh, all you need is to set up, uh, have a, a, a lattice with tri uh, with, where all the sides are trivalent. Uh, why do we need a trivalency? Because you have two objects fusing to give you a third. So that's why you need these trivalent junctions. And you could construct models in 3D or 2D. In 2D, you would get the famous Levinman models. But I'm going to restrict our discussion to 1D. So in the 1D case, uh, imagine that uh, you put, uh, you, you just put, uh, you just have these links now, uh, and on these links you put the objects in the category. Now the only rule is that the fusion uh, rules should be obeyed. So these two to f should fuse to give me uh, v, and it's up to me what I choose v. It's called the distinguished object. In, in to get some non-trivial dynamics in this problem, we usually take v to be uh, uh, half. So uh, to get the Ising model, what you do is that you just you just put the uh, uh, put the objects uh, uh, simple objects zero half and one on these uh, links, and you just require that they fuse to give you half. Uh, so there are two possible uh, two possibilities here. One is that uh, either the even odd links takes value zero and one, <laughs> and then the even links take the value sigma, or you could have the even links taking value 0 and 1, and the odd links taking the value sigma. But you can already see from the setup how the Ising model is coming. Because just by making sure that you obey the fusion algebra, you are getting a model where, uh, uh, where uh, you have uh, degrees of freedom on every, uh, on every alternate link which takes value 0 and 1. And these uh, middle links, they appear to be doing nothing. They, they're your so-called dual sites. And there are two possible uh, ways you could have done this. and uh, once you make a choice, you should just stick with it. Uh, so now let me tell you how to derive the IT model in the setup. So I've told you that, okay, I, I, I should construct my basis states in this way, where uh, I just chose the, the, uh, the convention where all the, uh, all the zero and one, uh, sorry, uh, where, um, uh, where the uh, zero and ones are on the odd sides and the sigmas are on the even sides. And the way to construct the model is, the, is just imagine that the spins, uh, that the two uh, Ising angles are coming, they're interacting with, with each other in some way and moving out. This is a very simple model, so there are only two possibilities. Either don't, don't interact, so sigma cross sigma is just one, or sigma cross, sigma cross sigma gives you psi. So I'm just telling you what happens when, you have to, when, when on this link sigma cross sigma gives you psi, uh, psi, well, uh, uh, after a little bit of algebra will show you that the matrix element of this projector is the same as the matrix element of Z1, Z3. So you end up getting the Ising term of the uh, of the transverse field Ising model. Whereas if I apply the projector on the side, uh, on the link, where you have uh, this uh, X, uh, uh, where you have not the dual side, but actual uh, uh, one of the objects, 0 or 1, then uh, you, you find that this projector, uh, matrix element of this projector is just the transverse field. Okay? Now, these are just projectors, so it's entirely up to me what the prefactors are. So I can choose the prefactors to be completely non-uniform, or I can choose the prefactors in such a way that these actually end up being uh, complex numbers so that I end up getting a Floca unitary. So I just want to stress that uh, this is a very nice way to move away from continuum theories or Hamiltonians 
but construct even Floquet physics or non-transmission physics. And right now I've just given this example here where I have a Hamiltonian and I have perfectly non-uniform couplings G and J. Uh, and uh, I can choose it whatever I like. But whatever be the choice, this model is guaranteed to have some symmetries. And, uh, and the rule of thumb always is that it, it has as many symmetries as there are simple objects. So the Ising model has three simple objects, 0, half, and 1. Turns out it has three symmetries. Uh, 0 is just the identity. 1 is uh, one is the, uh, is, the, is the fermion parity or the Z2 symmetry, and half is the duality symmetry, the so-called non-invertible symmetry. And what's also very powerful in this formalism is that I can, I can put this symmetry in any strange way in the space and time direction, and I can do like a unitary, uh, I can do local unitary transformations where I can twist the, these defects around. So they're indeed topological. Only the overall winding or whatever of the defects matters, but locally I can apply local unitary transformations and just move these defects around and uh, the system seems to remain the same. So in other words, if I was, for example, evaluating some autocorrelation function, which is trace of u dagger, operator u, operator, then that trace will remain invariant if uh, yeah, by local unitary transformations which move these defects around provided those uh, unitary transformations also commute with the operator which is entering in by autocorrelation function. So that is why these are known as topological defects. It's precisely because of this reason. So for example, if I were to now put a defect, uh, the previous example I gave you was completely defectless uh, Floquet unitary, right? Or Hamiltonian or whatever. I just have all the spins on these, uh, on the odd links, and uh, uh, and either the interactions between those spins is ZZ or it's X, right? That's what I learned. Uh, Prefactors could be inhomogeneous, but I can now put this uh, defect, uh, for example, between sites uh, uh, somewhere here, and then you can follow this pres prescription. And what this defect will tell you is that now these spins are no longer. Uh, 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 interacting as z1, z3, but they, uh, but you're forced to change the interaction to z1, x3. So uh, it's a very strange thing. Without knowing this formalism, I would not have guessed that this is a legitimate uh, or a reasonable way to modify my Hamiltonian. And what is the physical consequence of that? I mean, so there are some interesting physical consequences of this. So I'll, I'll come to that. So now uh, let me again. Uh, just do a quick review. So let's say I, I use this uh, uh, I, I, I do use this formalism to get my defectless Floquet model. Then it would be, for example, uh, something like this. Uh, it's product of all the ZZ, uh, ZZ interactions between spins followed by product uh, a transverse field on all the spins, and the couplings are completely uh, completely non-uniform. Um, but now, if I if I put the defect, then uh, this uh, the pictorial way to look at the defect are as follows. So uh, this is now the uh, the de uh, the, uh, the defect which is labeled by one, uh, which is the z which is perfectly unitary and is related to the uh, spin flip uh, operation. What is the, what it is saying is that if I in insert it in the Floquet unitary uh, from one step to the next, I sh I'm forced to flip the sign of the spin. But that's kind of obvious. You just insert a product of uh, poly, uh, poly operators, right? But what's more non-trivial is what the duality defect is doing. The duality defect is saying is doing something uh, non-local like this. It is saying that, oh, first of all, if I insert it, if originally the spins were on the even sides, I, uh, after I apply the defect, the spin should be on the odd sides. And moreover, uh, I should change the configurations of the spins in the following way. If, for example, H0 and H2 are both up up, then uh, uh, H1 prime should be along the poly x direction. Similarly, if H0 and H2 are both down uh, 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 down down, uh, H1 prime is in is in the is is uh, is also in the uh, poly uh, x direction. But if H0 and H2 are anti-parallel then it should be the poly minus x direction. So it is a 2 to 1 mapping, uh, which, is what, uh, uh, which, is, which is why it is a, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a non-unitary defect. 
Another important thing to note is that this is a linear transformation which is not Hermitian. Okay, there's no local unitary which can carry this out. There are local unitaries that can implement this Z2 symmetry, but there are no local unitaries that can implement this. So this is a problem in some sense. Uh, when I apply it in this uh, horizontal direction, it, this operation is, cannot be uh, implemented by any kind of local unitary. Okay, and then the other thing I wanted to say was that, uh, was that these ID topological, I can just move them around by doing some local unitary transformations. Uh, so uh, well, I'll, I'll, I'll explain more on that point. Okay. So, any, uh, so now let me go back and uh, tell you more about this duality defect. The spin flip defect is just a product of poly X's, uh, uh, which, which, which is already, already known. But the duality defect, uh, I explained to you what it does to a state, but when it acts on an operator, it literally does this transformation. Uh, it takes the product of the sigma t, sigma t operators on the odd sides and gives you a poly x matrix on the even side. And it, it takes a, a, a poly x matrix on the odd side and gives you a product of the, uh, of the zz spins on the, on the even sides. And moreover, you can actually just take this uh, operator and uh, explicitly show the, um, uh, explicitly show the fusion rules. So now, before I actually try to uh, explain to you how the manifestation in Floquet, I just want to give again some background. So how have people uh, used the fact that these models have not just the spin flip symmetry, but also this duality symmetry? And so uh, there's some, uh, some recent papers uh, from Armin's group and also, uh, also this group in Caltech. What they did is they studied a non-integrable Ising model which has both the Z2 symmetry as well as the duality symmetry. So another very nice thing about this formalism is that we're not tied to integral models. You can always, even though the initial example I gave was that of the atrocity model, I can also construct uh, models which are manifestly non-integrable and yet have both the duality symmetry as well as the Ising, as well as the spin fit symmetry in it. And what they showed is that if you take, if you include these terms, these are interacting terms that break integrability. And if you make the coupling really, really large, they force you to go into a gap phase. And the weird thing about the gap phase is that it is strictly degenerate. Okay? So normally, when you take the Ising model, you have two gap phases. One which is non-degenerate and the other which is degenerate. The non-degenerate is the paramagnetic phase and the degenerate one is the ferromagnetic phase. In contrast here, you have, if this non-linear term is large enough, you actually have a gap phase which is strictly degenerate. And the only way to, and it's not an accidental degeneracy because the degeneracy is between a ferromag two ferromagnetic phases and a paramagnetic phase. And the only way you can explain the degeneracy is through the duality symmetry. So it's not an accidental symmetry. So there are things like this you can do with the duality symmetry. You can make really strong constraints on uh, degeneracies of a uh, Hamiltonian. But again, the study has only been done in the ground state sector, and so it's very interesting to try and see what happens in the in a cloquet type setting. So that's where that's what we were trying to do here. So let me explain what we did. So uh, what we did is that, as I was mentioning, the, uh, these these defects are topological, right? So you can put them in in the in the space like direction, but you can also put them in the time like direction. So we looked at the defect in the time-like direction. It corresponds to really uh, taking a Floquet unitary and changing the boundary conditions on a particular link in some particular way. Uh, what that corresponds to is a Floquet unitary such as this. So here in this setting, uh, I'm taking all the Ising couplings to be uniform and all the transverse fields to be uniform. The Ising coupling is J and the transverse field is G. And moreover, uh, we put a, 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 a duality defect on this side, and all this uh, 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 transformations tells you that the duality defect on this side is asking you to modify the interactions on this link as follows. It is just, it looks very innocuous. It just says, oh, what was ZZ? Just make it ZX, okay? And then in the language of uh, the, uh, the Majoranas, it is still, uh, Bilinear and the Majoranas, provided you recognize that there is some a non-local uh, fellow here which we label as Omega. 
so there are several strange things about this Floquet unitary. Without the twist, there are an uh, even number of Majorana fermions in the Floquet unitary. After the twist, there are odd number of Majorana fermions in the Floquet unitary. And so that's got to do something really strange. Because just from counting arguments, suddenly you're working with a city where there is one less Majorana present. And indeed, what it does is that it gives you a zero mode. And this, I think, is the question that G was asking. So, so, so G, what you were asking about the Majoranas, I would say they're a consequence of this symmetry. So as a result of the symmetry, you get some localized modes. In this case, you get a single isolated Majorana mode. And you can construct it analytically or whatever. But the reason why it appears is really because of this underlying duality, duality symmetry in the problem. Uh, so normally, if I just take the Ising model and put open boundary conditions, I'll have a pair of Majorana modes. But instead now, with this duality twist, you have exactly one isolated Majorana mode. And it exists for any values of G and J. You don't have to make J to be greater than G or less than G. It just always exists because it's just due to counting. So anyway, so you can detect it in this infinite temperature autocorrelation function. And, uh, and, uh, and then you might ask, well, but what happened to that one Majorana? You, it's not like the Majoranas have vanished. So what, what happens is that, let's say I have uh, two L Majoranas in the problem. There are only two L minus one that explicitly appear in the, in the Floquet unitary because I put this twist. But there's still one remaining. It's not like it's just vanished. It's just that. It, its time evolution is really very straight. If I look at its autocorrelation function, it just decays very rapidly to zero. It's not like it's another missing Majorana and the two of them are in the usual Majorana pairs that you get with open boundary conditions. This, this, the twist really does force you to have just one single Majorana. And so what is the, yes? So this, uh, the localized mode now, is that like, uh, it, the topological mode is that? Yes, okay. it, so that, that's, a, that's a good question. So indeed, in this setup, this localized mode is sitting right where I put this defect. So it will be sitting right here. It's like the boundary, you know, you just put a boundary in the problem, and so this is, this is how it is. Okay. Now, but thank you for the question, because you might ask, okay, I have a Majorana, what's that got to do with the kramers vonier duality? Because remember, this has all got to do with the duality, duality symmetry. So to see the uh, effect of the duality, uh, you need to do a little bit of a local unitary transformation. So what I will do now is imagine this, uh, that I have a chain like this, where all the spins are, uh, where I have odd spins, 1, 3, 5, 7, 9, 11. And th the twist corresponds to putting some modification on, say, the link between sites 9 and 11. And uh, the links between all others are just the usual ones, which have Ising coupling J. And then these vertical lines just correspond to the transverse field. Okay? So uh, in this setup, as I mentioned, you get an isolated Majorana. And as uh, the Jaren was asking, yes, this isolated Majorana is localized where the twist is. Okay. Now, to uncover the kramers vonier transformation, what one does is one does a local unitary transformation that shifts this duality defect. So I told you one of the reasons why these defects are called topological is because you can construct local transformations that can translate the defect. So there is a, def there is a local unitary which translates this defect from sites 9 and 11 to sites 9 and 7. Okay? So what happens is that this Majorana still stays fixed at site 11. But remarkably, what you find is that the coupling between sites 9 and 11, the exchange coupling between sites 9 and 11 is now actually, the strength of it is given by the transfer field. So what has happened is that there's a kramers vonier transformation that has happened between sites 11 and 9. I can keep doing this unitary transformation. I can move this, uh, this duality defect between sites 6 and 5. So I move it another one. And then this Majorana is still, still fixed here. But now, again, uh, uh, for all the sites between where the Majorana is located and the twist, you have a kramers vonier transformation where the rows of J and G have interchanged. So then it is kind of morally clear what the Majorana is trying to do. <coughs> The Majorana is trying to separate two regions, one where J is greater than G and the one where J is less than G. When I naively put in the initial twist, it was the limit of zero domain wall width. And I just had to do a few unitary transformations to uncover that really what the Majorana is trying to do is allowing you to have a unitary where on one side of it, <coughs> J is greater than G and the other side of it, J is less than G. Okay? Okay. Anyway, so uh, 
Okay, so this is great. So now uh, all this I showed for you for the case where I can re literally write the model as a fermion bilinear. So that's why I could solve it and do it many things analytically. A question that you might be asking is what happens if I break integrity breaking perturbations? So this is what we looked at in this paper where we actually broke integrability in a very crude way because we broke integrability in such a way that the duality is no longer a symmetry. So it was not like the example I gave where you could break integrability the duality is a symmetry. And, and surprisingly what we found was that the Majorana is still very stable for small system sizes. So if, just to remind you, if I have open boundary conditions and you have a pair of Majorana modes, then this, those Majorana modes are extremely unstable because they come in pairs so they can hybridize. So the smaller the system, they are more unstable they are. That's why it's so difficult to get these things experimentally. But here, because I have an isolated Majorana, it doesn't have a cousin with which it can hybridize with easily. So it's actually already very stable to begin with. And when you start putting in interactions, if my system size is very small, then it just doesn't decay because of small system size effects. So I'll show you this plot uh, for the autocorrelation. For, so, so this is the autocorrelation function of this related to this isolated Majorana. <coughs> and this is for different system sizes, n equal to 10, 12, uh, 10, 12, and 14. And what you find is that uh, basically if I have a system which is say L equal to 10, this is not decaying. It's just going down and settling down to a given plateau. If I, if I had open boundary conditions and a pair of them, then this would have simply decayed to zero, but it doesn't decay. And the only reason it doesn't decay is that it requires the rest of the wire to act like a very good reservoir. So if I have a system size which is just 10 or 12, it's the rest of the wire is simply not such a good reservoir for this Majorana to decay, and I have to make L really very large for it to be able to go away. As a result, when we did study this on the quantum computer, it was actually uh, very easy to see this on the quantum computer. It was not at all like what you would see with the Floke Isaac model with open boundary conditions, where you would have, you know, had the thing decay immediately. It's because it's isolated, it just stays there and it's very easy to see it on the quantum computer and this is the autocorrelation function on the, on the quantum computer which is uh, living for a fairly long time. Anyway, so with this I'll just add the conclusions. I just want to say that by using this uh, fusion category which has been used before quite a bit, for example, to construct 2D models like the Levin-Benn models that they based out of it, uh, but now, but I, I, I highlighted it in 2D, it's a way to get systems not necessarily uh, uh, in the continuum and not necessarily any Hamiltonian, it could even be a Floke unitary, which naturally has a zoo of these symmetries, which are your regular unitary symmetries, whereas also these non-Ebelian symmetries. And moreover, uh, uh, so uh, the simplest example was this one, which is related to the kramer gornier duality transformation. And there are many interesting things one could do here. You could have defect junctions. So just uh, the algebra of these operators is very rich. And how does that show up? How does that manifest in, in time evolution? And of course, there's also the interesting question of realizing the topological defects, uh, uh, implementing them, uh, because I showed you that when you, when you apply it in the space-like direction, it's not, it's, a, it's, a, it's not a simple unitary transformation. Uh, anyway, so that uh, And, that, and the decay channels are kind of blocked when you have a very small system size. Right? But that doesn't, those decay, for example, let me just explain again. So suppose I had just open boundary conditions. Then we know we have a myron on one end and myron on the other. How do they decay? They hybridize. But in this case, you just have an isolated myron. And the only way for it to decay is to relax with the reservoir. And if, there, if you don't have a good reservoir, then it won't relax. 
but the way you got the 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 layer at a zero mode is through that the duality transform, right? Oh, I see what you're saying. So, so the thing is that it? there is still an approximately conserved quantity. Ah, I see. So you can construct it numerically. There is an approximate conserved quantity which you can show becomes an exactly conserved quantity when L goes to infinity and the integrals terms are zero. Quasi yeah, there's a quasi conserved quantity I which you can numerically construct. Okay. Let me conclude by thanking the speaker and thanking all the speakers and thank you all for attending.